Hi, uh, everyone. Um, this is Justin Campbell from Liberty Works. Uh, today I've got with me Toby Young, uh, who's recently uh, published an article on Teach First about the role of IQ in education. That article, after initially being published with a rebuttal, was was removed from the website and replaced by an apology for publishing it in the first place. So I've got um, Toby Young here to um, to uh, go through, first of all, what happened um, and um, maybe some of the implications of of uh, that kind of censorship. So, um, Toby, would you be able to uh, first tell us what, what happened with your article? Sure, Justin. Um, so about two months ago, I was contacted by Teach First, which is a charity that aims to recruit graduates from top universities in England and Wales uh, to teach at some of the most uh, challenging schools in the most deprived parts of England and Wales in order to raise educational standards. And it's a charity I've always supported. I'm involved in the English education reform movement. I run a charity which advises groups on how to set up free schools or what, what would be called charter schools in the US. Uh, so they contacted me and asked if I would speak at a forthcoming conference, as it then was, um, uh, and I agreed. And um, the conference was, um, uh, the theme was social mobility. What can schools do uh, to boost social mobility? Um, and uh, they also asked me if I'd write something for their website. So I wrote something for their website. Uh, and submitted it about um, four weeks ago. Um, and uh, I didn't hear what they were planning to do with it uh, until after I'd spoken at the conference, which was uh, the week before last. I spoke at the conference on a Thursday, participated in a panel. Uh, there was a bit of back and forth between me and one of the other panelists, but it was a perfectly civilized debate. Um, mm. And uh, and then um, they contacted me uh, shortly afterwards, the next day, someone from Teach First contacted me to say that they were going to run my blog post on the Teach First website uh, with um, uh, a another piece expressing an alternative point of view, and it would be billed as a debate. And they duly did this. Um, and then a couple of days later, um, I found out on Twitter that they had taken down both my piece um, and the other piece, which was by a professor of education, um, uh, and apologized, as you said, for publishing my piece. And in a tweet, um, one of the uh, high ups at Teach First um, described my piece as wrong, mm. um, uh, which was quite surprising because um, uh, my piece was essentially summarizing our mainstream scientific understanding of the uh, heritability of IQ and the role that IQ plays uh, uh, when it comes to different exam results achieved by different students. Um, and it was all pretty uncontroversial, uh, I thought anyway. Um, but the Teach First uh, were evidently so horrified um, by this point of view, even though it was presented in the context of a debate and an alternative point of view was expressed directly beneath mine, uh, they decided to take it down, describe it as wrong and apologize for it. Uh, one of the disturbing things about it was that I think that the, 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 the Teach First believes that the mainstream scientific understanding of the impact of um, different IQs on educational outcomes is incompatible with their vision and values. They said uh, in this apology that they printed on their website that what I'd written was incompatible with their uh, vision and values, which struck me as odd. I mean, odd because I don't think it is. I think you can still understand what the mm -hmm. science tells us about um, uh, uh, the relationship between um, genetically based individual differences and different uh, uh, outcomes for different students in schools and still be committed to um, trying to improve standards and particularly to try and improve the uh, attainment of uh, the least well off. Um, so it struck me as odd that they thought that uh, their vision of values were incompatible with what I understand to be the mainstream science uh, in this area, but also unwise to claim that what they believed and what they're aiming to do is incompatible with the science. Um, and it seemed to me that uh, it was uh, fairly typical in various ways 
of the manner in which educationalists, both in secondary schools and in the tertiary education sector, um, conduct themselves. I mean, not only are they intolerant of any points of view that they regard as unorthodox, that challenge conventional thinking uh, in education, um, but in addition, they think that their particular values are conditional upon being what is essentially an environmental determinist. Mm embracing an environmental determinist point of view, uh, which, you know, which, which, which I don't think it is. I think their vision and values are perfectly compatible uh, with acknowledging that um, uh, differences between people are at least in part genetically based. Um, and to, to, to deny the science around that uh, is to, I think, build your house on fairly weak foundations. Yes, yes. Um, on, that, on that note... Um, when I was uh, writing writing the, the article that'll go with this interview, I, um, I I thought of John Stuart Mill and and he said whether something's um, true or false, I'm I'm summarising here because I can't remember the quote. Um, you know, it's either you've either had the chance to have a better understanding of the truth, or you've um, or you've been able to prove a falsehood. And by shutting down your article shutting down your article, they've done neither. They've, um, and um, uh, I'm not very familiar with the UK education context, but in the Australia, we're, we're increasing, uh, we're spending billions and billions and billions of dollars on education um, policies that seem to make no improvement, no improvement. Um, our PISA scores continue to drop. And if, and if people aren't willing to even look at the evidence the the potential possible evidence that you've um that you raised in your article and um, be honest about what schools can achieve then that's a very that's a very dangerous thing for society so uh, what what would you say to that yeah well I think that's that's right I mean I think um you know they 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 breached Mill's principle on two counts um, mm. the first count was that just because they don't think it's true it is mm. not a reason to shut down debate on the issue uh, but they also breached it in the sense that you know what i said was true um mm. so in addition to shutting down debate they were denying uh mainstream science i think you're right i think uh you know um uh, i think wanting to raise educational standards wanting to reduce attainment gaps as far as it's possible to do that between mm. disadvantaged and advantaged students um, is is a laudable aim. But um, it's going to be harder, not easier, to achieve that uh, if you deny uh, our best scientific understanding of why those gaps arise. Um, I, one of the things I said in my blog post, which incidentally mm. I reposted on my own mm. website, which is no sacred cows uk, and I've also reposted the reply by the professor of education. Um, mm. One of the things I said, I think, which uh, which seemed to upset the people at Teach First and other people who uh, responded to the blog post when it was still up on their website on Twitter, uh, was that I said that uh, until now schools uh, had not been able to successfully raise the. IQs of individual students. I acknowledge that uh, schools at a population level uh, can boost mean IQ. That seems to be a fairly robust finding. It's something that uh, a finding associated with a political scientist based in New Zealand called James Flynn and known as the Flynn effect. We see average IQs uh, in the developed world uh, increasing decade by decade since 1945. And one explanation for that is because school systems in those countries uh, are improving and more and more people are being educated. Um, uh, so it's, it's perfectly possible that schools uh, can raise the mean IQ of students, uh, but we don't quite know how that's happening. And we certainly don't know, uh, at least this is my understanding of the latest scientific evidence, mm. we certainly don't know how to raise the IQs of individual students. And that's not to say we can't raise individual student attainment. We can, but we can't do that by hoping to uh, make interventions that raise the general cognitive ability of individual students. And again, it, it might be possible to do that. Indeed, it, it might be possible to do that when uh, we have a better understanding of the neurobiology 
of intelligence. Mm. And it may be that we develop technologies uh, in the not too distant future, which enables us to raise the IQs of individual students and I hope we do but at the moment I don't think we do and the evidence that we can and that interventions have successfully managed that is pretty threadbare involving very small sample sizes uh, and generally experiments which haven't been successfully replicated um, mm. uh, and I, as you say I think uh, uh, unless um, uh, various uh, uh, well-funded educational policies across the developed world um, take into account the difficulty of actually raising the general cognitive ability of individual students, then a lot of money is being wasted. And of course, a lot of money has been wasted on that particular object, because so far it hasn't been done with any success. Mm -hmm. um, right, right. Yeah, so um, I, there's a lot of similarities with what's happened with you and um, Charles Murray with the bell curve. Um, and I know you've uh, previously written about um, about uh, Charles Murray and the bell curve in The Spectator, I believe. Um, why do you think it is that people are so unwilling to consider the evidence in anything related to IQ, it would seem? Well, I, I have indeed written about Charles Murray in The Spectator. I also wrote a longer piece for an Australian magazine called Quadrant a couple of years ago. Oh, yes. so, discussed uh, the bell curve at length and I also discussed um, the hostile reaction it provoked in a lecture I gave recently but which is online you can find it uh, on YouTube um, okay. and the title of the lecture was um, liberal creationism I think um, I mean I think uh, Charles Murray um, uh, and Richard Pernstein who he co-authored the bell curve with um, did touch on the live rail of racial differences in IQ. Um, mm. And that, of course, is um, extremely controversial and has been um, for a very long time. Um, uh, and it's not something I wrote about in the Teach First blog post. I didn't write about gender differences either. Um, mm. uh, what I said was pretty anodyne and uncontroversial. I tried to steer clear of anything too controversial. So it was all the more surprising when they thought even even this toe in the water, as it were, into this um, uh, subject was too much uh, for them and their readers. Um, I think, generally speaking, the reason um, the liberal left is so hostile to um, any form of hereditarianism is because, um, uh, broadly speaking, um, uh, the liberal left um, uh, believes that all the sins of this world um, have been taught to human beings uh, as a result of um, socialization, culture, um, capitalism, and so forth, um, and are not endemic to um, human nature. And so therefore they think uh, they can create a, a better uh, utopian world um, uh, just by uh, socializing people in the right way. If you acknowledge that there is uh, something called human nature and it is immutable and has various characteristics uh, which are going to be very difficult to eliminate and which for the most part are incompatible with various forms of socialist utopianism, um, then you've got much more difficulty, I think, clinging on to your particular ideology, your particular political philosophy. So I think there is this link um, uh, in a lot of people's minds on the liberal left that if they're going to bring about a more equal society um, uh, in which uh, uh, you have genuine equality of outcome, not just opportunity. Um, uh, you have to deny that uh, individual differences uh, are genetically based, mm. or at least in part. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, and um, um, it's it's funny you say that they deny it, yet they're quite happy to accept findings of behavioural economics to. Um, to discredit free market free market economics, so uh, they, they're quite happy to um, believe humans have certain innate um, psychological uh, characteristics when when it suits their agenda. But um, I mean, reading some of the tweets that were um, directed at you, they were quite quite over the top and hysterical. Um, so, well, do you I think, think that there's this there's this other? I mean, that there's I think the, the sort of the main reason is that. Mm. Um, a lot of 
the liberal left's political philosophy um, uh, just doesn't sit very well um, with a mainstream scientific understanding of mm. uh, human nature, how human nature has evolved, what the origins of individual differences are, and so forth. So there's that reason. But there's also the uh, toxic historical baggage associated mm. with genetics. Um, yes. uh, and so, you know, whenever you bring any of this stuff up, um, uh, you know, you often get accused of being a Nazi or um, a eugenicist of some kind. Um, mm. uh, and, and there is this feeling that uh, even if this stuff is true, it's very dangerous to disseminate it because it can lead to um, kind of uh, junk science of various kinds. It can give sucker to white supremacists or God knows what mm. else. I mean, I think that the, 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 then there's a kind of twofold response to that. The first is, well, no, it can't, not if it's properly understood. Um, uh, and uh, and secondly, um, uh, well, there's a lot of toxic baggage associated with left-wing environmentally determinist philosophies too. And you just have to look at uh, the atrocities carried out by Chairman Mao, um, Stalin, Pol Pot, uh, and so forth, uh, to understand that uh, the death toll on the side of environmental determinists is probably higher than it is on the side of hereditarians. Mm -hmm. um, fascinating. Now, um, was there um, anything else that you um, that you wanted to bring up um, from from this incident, or do you think you've probably covered covered everything at this stage? Um, I think no. Uh, I mean, I think uh, probably just to put it in the context of um, uh, increasing intolerance of uh, any right of center uh, 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 people um, in the educational sector generally, and um, not just in England, um, but mm. in uh, the US and in Australia, and really across the developed world, there seems to be an increasing unwillingness um, to discuss any ideas which challenge the orthodoxies of the kind of liberal left uh, worldview. Um, and uh, I think that's troubling. Um, and one of the features that this, um, this uh, new attack on free speech takes, as I'm sure you've probably discussed before, mm. is, is this kind of um, hijacking of J.S. Mill's harm principle. Um, mm. So the argument um, against certain forms of free speech uh, used to be um, that um, if people were exposed to, say, violent video games, uh, that would cause them to behave violently and would end up harming others. Or if they were exposed to um, certain sexual practices, uh, that might lead them to not only harm others in due course, but to harm themselves. But it was always... Uh, a consequentialist argument that um, uh, the harm was something being exposed to this particular mm. seditious material of whatever kind, be it a book, a film, a play, some ideas, uh, would lead you to eventually cause someone else or yourself harm. The new form this argument takes is that merely being exposed to the material is itself a form of harm. It doesn't matter mm. whether it leads to behavior which could be deemed harmful in due course. No, just being exposed to certain material is in itself harmful. Um, it either is harmful to your mental health, um, it's harmful to your sense of well-being, it's harmful because it offends you in some way. Um, and uh, one of the, one of the uh, and I think that, that there was something like that thinking going on behind the decision to redact my blog post on Teach First, that merely exposing people to this mm. point of view uh, was in itself harmful. Um, it, could, mm. it could undermine their resolve, their commitment to um, raising standards, to teaching in deprived areas or something along those lines. And I think um, one of the problems, I mean, there are many problems with, with that particular argument for restricting free speech, but one of the problems is it depends upon um, uh, painting a portrait of the people you're trying to protect from harm as being much more fragile and vulnerable than they really are. Um, uh, you know, uh, students are often held up as a group who uh, require protecting from mm. harmful points of view. So when, um, uh, uh, when Ben Shapiro 
um, spoke at uh, UC Berkeley um, not so long ago, um, uh, the university authorities offered counselling uh, to the students at Berkeley uh, just in case they found what he had to say so upsetting that they, they went, you know, they went mad and needed and needed kind of the help of university council. Of course, they don't offer these services whenever right of, whenever left of centre people speak on campuses. And it's just as well that they don't think that being exposed to left of centre points of view uh, has a potentially harmful effect on students' mental health, because after all, you know, something like 90 percent of all faculty members across mm -hmm. the Ivy League are left wing. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, so the councillors would have their hands pretty full if they extended that same principle to being exposed to left of centre points of view. Um, but actually, the, the, the absurdity of this line of argument is kind of portraying, you know, students at places like Berkeley, at Evergreen, at uh, wherever it might be, uh, Yale, Harvard, as, as being kind of incredibly fragile. They need these safe spaces. Uh, they need trigger warnings if uh, they're going to be exposed to anything remotely challenging or unorthodox. Um, it's, uh, but if you actually look at the, the, this, these kind of delicate, fragile creatures that these enemies of free speech are claiming they're trying to protect, I mean, they don't seem remotely fragile. I mean, frankly, quite a lot of them seem like kind of thugs. Um, <laughs> and, and if you look at the statistics on uh, drug taking, in um, uh, universities, not just in America, but in the UK as well. I mean, they're taking more drugs now, students, than they ever have before. I mean, you know, more than half taking uh, uh, cannabis more than once a month, you know, uh, something like half taking ketamine, uh, one mm. half of the student population of the UK taking ketamine at least once a month, which is a, a, a sedative that they give to uh, patients in intensive care. I mean, you know, if you want to protect students and if you're concerned about their mental health, why not focus on trying to reduce the vast quantities of illegal drugs that they're consuming uh, at a greater rate than ever before? I mean, mm. that's what they, that, they need. They need. They need. They need. Trigger warnings should be attached to tablets of MDMA and ketamine, not um, you know uh, Ben Shapiro's uh, views about you know the Palestine-Israeli conflict. I mean, it's just yeah. it's totally bonkers. It's completely absurd. It's actually, I think, just a form of rhetoric that um, postmodernist uh, um, enemies of Western civilization and Enlightenment values dress up their real agenda in. Uh, one thing I'd just like to take back to is um, what do you see the role of charter schools or free schools, as you call them, in, in the UK in sort of breaking this education establishments uh, control so that so that people can set up schools that actually look at you know the science and the evidence rather than just based on ideology do you think that it has the potential to have a big impact on getting us to education policies that might actually work and improve outcomes well um i think i mean i, I wouldn't want to exaggerate um the mm. extent to which um uh, the postmodernist left, the left mm. that opposed to free speech, which doesn't regard facts as sacrosanct, mm. which sees reason and logic as the tools of white privilege. I don't yeah. think that particular virulent strain of the left has captured um, the um, primary and secondary education systems of England. Um, right. uh, it may be that they're making inroads, um, mm. but I don't think it's been completely, I don't think those sectors have been completely captured yet. So I, I, I think I should make that clear. Um, I think that um, uh, charter schools, free schools, certainly do have a role to play in preserving uh, an element of diversity and plurality in our public education systems. Um, mm. uh, one of the things Mill warns about in uh, his essay on education um, is the state capture of education. And he thought that was very dangerous because once the state is essentially funding public providers of education, the state can then ensure that its values are disseminated um, uh, and any values likely to challenge the state's power are suppressed. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, certainly that is a danger. Uh, that is um, inherent in any public education system. Um, and one way of uh, mitigating against that um, is to allow independent providers uh, to set up taxpayer-funded schools. Um, and I think 
uh, as uh, and that, that not only does that preserve an element of diversity, but it also gives because of that, it gives parents a bit more choice of where they send their children to school and creates an element of competition, which is all to the good. Um, uh, and it and it, it it's uh, and and I think the there are now um, uh, nearly four hundred uh, free schools that are open in England. There are another. 300 or so in the pipeline um if everything goes well and the present government survives by 2022 which is when the end of this due to come to open free schools um in england's uh england education sector um and uh, not only um are some of them a little bit different but uh, they've been uh, definitely pioneering Many of them are pioneering uh, new ways of teaching, uh, which are proving to be very effective. So the op those three schools that have opened so far are um, above average uh, across the uh, educational sector for the most part. Um, and uh, getting better than average uh, ratings from the state inspectorate. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, my hope is that um, in addition to preserving uh, diversity and parental choice within our public education system they can also pioneer new and more effective ways of teaching which the rest of the school system can benefit from yes yes uh, well that's um, that's a very liberal concept of diversity and choice and um, letting um, you know uh, letting the best things come um, uh, emerge so um, that's a positive note to end on I think um, and hopefully um, charter schools in Australia are only in their infancy. I don't believe there's a single one in my home state in Queensland, but um, but there are um, some. I believe there's some in the state of New South Wales. So hopefully we can look to the fine work you're doing over in the UK and other people in the UK and, um, and push for that policy um, back here in Australia. Thank uh -huh. you for your time today. Thank you. Um, Thanks, Justin. Good to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um